I am speaking to you in the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. You can imagine what a bitter blow it is to me that all my long struggle to win peace has failed. Yet I cannot believe that there is anything more or anything different that I could have done and that would have been more successful. Up to the very last, it would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honorable settlement between Germany and Poland. But Hitler would not have it. He had evidently made up his mind to attack Poland whatever happened. And although he now says he put forward reasonable proposals which were rejected by the Poles, that is not a true statement. The proposals were never shown to the Poles, nor to us. And though they were announced in the German broadcast on Thursday night, Hitler did not wait to hear comments on them, but ordered his troops to cross the Polish frontier the next morning. The action shows convincingly that there is no chance of expecting that this man will ever give up his practice of using force to gain his will. He can only be stopped by force. And we in France are today, in fulfillment of our obligations, going to the aid of Poland, who is so bravely resisting this wicked and unprovoked attack upon her people. We have a clear conscience. We have done all that any country could do to establish it. But a situation in which no word given by Germany's ruler could be trusted, and no people or country could feel itself safe, is horrible. Now that we have resolved to finish it, I know that you will all play your part with calmness and courage. Mr. Speaker, on Friday evening last, I received His Majesty's commission to form a new administration. It was the evident wish and will of Parliament and the nation that this should be conceived on the broadest possible basis and that it should include all parties, both those who supported the late government 
and also the parties of the opposition. I have completed the most important part of this task. A war cabinet has been formed of five members. This was a great trial of strength between the British and German air forces. Can you conceive a greater objective for the Germans in the air than to make evacuation from these beaches impossible? And to sink all these ships which were displayed almost to the extent of thousands? Could there have been an objective of greater military importance and significance for the whole purpose of the war of this, they tried hard and they were beaten back. They were frustrated in their task. We got the army away and they have paid fourfold for any losses which they have inflicted. Mr. Speaker, in the disastrous military events which have happened during the past fortnight have not come to me with any sense of surprise. Indeed, I indicated a fortnight ago, as clearly as I could to the House, that the worst possibilities were open. And I made it perfectly clear that whatever happened in France would make no difference to the resolve of Britain and the British Empire to fight on if necessary for years, if necessary alone. Mm, I have thought it right upon this occasion to give the House and the country some indication of the solid practical ground upon which we base our inflexible resolve to continue the war. There are a good many people who say, never mind, win or lose, sink or swim, better die than submit to tyranny, and such a tyranny. And I do not dissociate myself from them. But I can assure them that our professional advisors of the three services unitedly advise that we should carry on the war and that there are good and reasonable hopes of final victory. We have fully informed and consulted all the self-governing dominions. These great communities, far beyond the oceans, who have been built up on our laws and on our civilization and who are absolutely free to choose their course, but are absolutely devoted to the ancient motherland and who feel themselves inspired by the same emotions which lead me to stake our all upon duty and honor. And we do not yet know what will happen in France or whether the French resistance will be prolonged, both in France and in the French Empire overseas. The French government will be throwing away great opportunities and casting adrift their future if they do not continue the war in accordance with their treaty obligation, from which we have not felt able to release. The House will have read the historic declaration in which it is the desire of many Frenchmen and of our own hearts. We have proclaimed our willingness at the darkest hour in French history to conclude a union of common citizenship in this struggle. However matters may go in France or with the French government or other French governments, we in this island and in the British Empire We'll never lose our sense of comradeship with the French people. If we are now called upon to endure what they have been suffering, we shall emulate their courage. And if final victory rewards our toils, they shall share the gain. I and freedom shall be restored to all. We abate nothing of our just demands. Not one jot or tittle do we receive. Czechs, Poles, Norwegians, Dutch, Belgians have joined their causes to our own. All these shall be restored. But General Vagon calls the Battle of France is over. 
I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free, and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted silence. Let us, therefore, brace ourselves to our duty. Мы должны организовать всесторонний, 
Его мощь красной армии обеспечит усилие наполнение ее работ, обеспечит ее снабжение всем необходимым, организовать быстрое продвижение транспорта в Сланскан. Иванин Груза, Иоанн помощь Раминды. Мы должны укрепить тыл красной армии, подчинить интересам этого дела всю свою работу, обеспечить усиленную работу всех предприятий, производить больше пинтов, пулеметов, орудий, патронов, снарядов, самолетов, организовать охрану заводов, электростанций, телефонные и телеграфные связи, наладить местную противовоздушную оборону. Мы должны организовать беспощадную борьбу со всякими организаторами цела, дезертивами, паникерами, распространителями смыслов, уничтожать шпионов, диверсантов, вражеских парашютистов, оказывая во всем этом быстрое содействие нашим истребительным батальонам. Нужно иметь в виду, что враг, товарин, Питер, Орбитер, Вагнами и Аспортен нужны способы. Нужно учитывать все это и не поддаваться на провода. Нужно немедленно принимать суду военного трибунала за их то, что свои политические и прошлости решали за народ, не взирая на лица. И вынуждены отходить часть той красной армии, нужно уравнять весь подвижный железнодорожный состав. Не оставлять против ни одного паровоза, ни одного ворона. Не оставлять противника ни килограмма хлеба, ни литра горючего. Полковники должны удалять весь скот. Деньги сдавать под центральную с государственным уровнем. Для вырезки в целом районе. Собственное имущество, в том числе четыре металла. Деньги горючие, которые не могут быть вырезаны, потому что безусловно уничтожены. security because the nub of the whole purpose of your president is to keep you now and your children later and your grandchildren much later out of a last ditch war for the preservation of American independence and all the things that American independence means to you and to me and to ours never before since Jamestown and Plymouth Rock has our American civilization been in such danger as now. The Nazi masters of Germany have made it clear that they intend not only to dominate all life and thought in their own country, 
but also to enslave the whole of Europe, and then to use the resources of Europe to dominate the rest of the world. In view of the nature of this undeniable threat, it can be asserted properly and categorically that the United States has no right or reason to encourage talk of peace until the day shall come when there is a clear intention on the part of the aggressor nations to abandon all thought of dominating or conquering the world. The forces of the states that are lead against all people who live in freedom are being held away from our shores. The Germans and Italians are being blocked on the other side of the Atlantic by the British and by the Greeks and by thousands of soldiers and sailors who are able to escape from subjugated countries. The Japanese are being engaged in China, in Asia, by the Chinese nation in another great defense. In the Pacific Ocean is our fleet, guns loaded with explosive bullets, economic as well as military. Frankly and definitely, there is danger ahead. Danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger or the fear of it by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. Germany has said that she was occupying Belgium to save the Belgians from the British. Would she hesitate then to say to any South American country, we are occupying you to protect you from aggression by the United States? Belgium is being used as an invasion base against Britain, now fighting for its life. And any South American country in Nazi hands would always constitute a jumping off place for German attack on any one of the other republics of this hemisphere. We think of Hawaii as an outpost of defense in the Pacific, yet the Azores are closer to our shores in the Atlantic than Hawaii is on the other side. There are those who say that the Axis powers would never have any desire to attack the Western Hemisphere. This is the same dangerous form of wishful thinking which has destroyed the powers of resistance of so many conquered peoples. Let us no longer blind ourselves to the undeniable fact that the evil forces which have crushed and undermined and corrupted so many others are already within our own gates. Your government knows much about them, and every day is ferreting them out. Their secret emissaries are active in our own and neighboring country. They seek to stir up suspicion and dissension, cause internal strife. They try to turn capital against labor and vice versa. They try to reawaken long, slumbering racial and religious enmities, which, which should have no place in this country. 
And there are also American citizens, many of them in high places, who unwittingly, in most cases, are aiding and abetting the work of these agents. I do not charge these American citizens with being foreign agents, but I do charge them with doing exactly the kind of work that the dictators want done in the United States. The experience of the past two years has proven beyond doubt that no nation can appease the Nazi. No man can tame a tiger into a kitten by stroking it. There can be no appeasement with ruthlessness. There can be no reasoning with an incendiary bomb. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking.